Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 98. I think cinema, movies, and magic have always been closely associated. The very earliest people who made films were magicians. Francis Ford Coppola. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh. And you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects, and you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Videoblocks is offering The Tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for The Tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. Now, guys, today's show is uh, a reaction to basically so many emails, messages, tweets about my camera rig that I used for This Is Meg when I was shooting it. I posted a few pictures of my rig and me wearing it like a crazy person. And uh, people went crazy and really wanted to know why. First of all, I I I decided to shoot with a black magic uh, cinema camera as opposed to a red or an Alexa or something like that. Uh, and then also how I was able to build the camera that I, I used. Like, so what lenses did I use? What kind of camera rig did I use? What kind of preview monitor? All these kind of questions. So I decided to put together a podcast and a very detailed um, show notes uh, or article, which will be obviously at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 098. So everything I talk about in this episode will be in that URL. And I put direct links on where I bought everything, price points and things like that. So let's just go back. Let's take it back before we get into it. Let's take it back a little bit to so many months ago when I decided to make this movie. Uh, I decided to make this movie in April. We are now in September. So in April, I decided like, I'm going to go make a movie. And I had I owned a Blackmagic cinema camera, 2.5K, which I used for some you know internet stuff and some minor little... Uh, things so that's why I never got a 4K camera at the time because it was a little bit just didn't make sense for like YouTube and stuff like that at the moment. So I had this camera. I was like, well, let me you know. Let me let me see. Let me start testing it. So I started testing it. I, I have a set of Rokinon lenses, um, which I'm going to actually go into a whole other uh, podcast about the lenses and about uh, where to get them and all that stuff in another podcast. But I had some Rokinon lenses. I had a Sigma uh, 18 to 30 uh, zoom lens. And I started playing with it. And since I'm a colorist, I started throwing it up on the Da Vinci and seeing what I could do. So I started pushing the camera and seeing what I could do with it. And I was really shocked at how beautiful the images came out. You know, and you know, I've I've worked with Alexa, I've worked with Reds, uh, I've worked with Phantoms, I've worked with a ton of different high-end cameras, but this little camera was really impressive. And uh, for what it was, you know, like for the it by far it's the best bang for your buck on the market. There's no question. I'll argue anybody that for the money, this is the best image you can get for the money uh, and have the ability to have a raw file 
in color grading. It's amazing. It really, really is uh, remarkable. And I'll talk a little bit about the post workflow about the camera in, in a little bit uh, towards the end of the episode. So anyway, I decided to put together, uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to shoot with this camera. So I've got a lens package that I've had. And um, a couple tips I wanted to give you guys on when you're shooting with a Blackmagic cinema camera. Well, and, and by the way, first of all, people ask me, well, why didn't you shoot with the 4K version? And why did you shoot 2.5? Simple answer was I own the 2.5. I didn't want to spend extra money on getting a 4K. And then also the amount of hard drive space and media that I would need to have purchased to have uh, to get just to be able to work with all the workflow considering I was the DIT I was the assistant editor I was everything I needed to simplify the workflow for myself so what I decided to do is just shoot it at 2.5 so let's just put it just put it into perspective if you get a card uh, let's say a 240 gig card um, an SS, SSD card is what they uh, what the black magic shoots on it, that gives you at raw 2.5 gives you about 45 minutes. Now, if uh, I would have shot 4K, that 45 minutes would have turned into 20 some minutes. And then I would have had to purchase more of them or purchase larger ones. So like my 48, uh, I have a 480 gig card as well. That gave me about an hour and a half of raw, uh, which is pretty amazing. But uh, they're expensive, man. They're like a hundred and some dollars each. Now, mind you, not as expensive as a Red or an Alexa situ- situation. But you know, for a very low budget kind of movie, I wanted to kind of make it as bare bones as possible, and also I wanted to kind of create this experiment to see if I could create a full blown feature film that looks looks good at a, such a low budget with a you know a, a camera that's not known for making cinematic images. Not, 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 don't get me wrong, they are, but like you know, nothing compared to an Alexa or a Red. So I wanted to see what I could do with it. So I said, screw it, I'm going to do 2.5. It just made more sense for me workflow-wise. So right now, just so you guys know, I shot about six terabytes of footage for this little, little movie shooting red. I mean, shooting a raw. And so if I would have shot 4K, it would have been 12 terabytes. Now, 12 terabytes, you know, like, oh, I would just get a couple of, you know, eight, eight terabyte drives and you're good to go. Yeah, but, you know, if you want redundancy, if you want to have at least two copies of everything, which is what I have, plus have a array drive. So if things crash, uh, you have protection, things like that, it starts getting pretty pricey. So a six terabyte to 10 terabyte situation becomes a lot, a big, big, big difference, especially at this price point. So uh, a couple tips. This camera loves light, lots and lots and lots of light. So make sure you always give it plenty of light. It holds the highlights very well. And it also um, digs into the darks very well. I was surprised at how much um, how much it kept the latitude on this. It's, you know, on the paperwork it says thirteen stops. So you know, and I wouldn't push it that far. But if you put if you shoot it down the middle and you have probably you know three or four stops, real clean latitude, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And you also want to shoot it at a four hundred ISO. I know they say it's rated at an eight hundred ISO, but um, both Austin, my uh, my second camera, and Gaffer, and myself, both figured out that 400 was the way to go, and uh, and we could tell the difference. So we definitely shooting 400 ISO. Now, by the way, anyone who's listening to this, and and if I'm talking gibberish to you guys, because uh, you don't understand everything I'm talking about, uh, that's fine. I'm just kind of going to go over a little bit of this. Uh, I'm not expecting you guys to know everything I'm talking about, but I wanted to at least put the information out there. And there's a little bit, a lot more detailed um, information on the post at uh, the IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 098. So the other big thing is do not, and I repeat, do not shoot a feature film in ProRes 422HQ. You will be tempted to shoot in ProRes because that 480 gig um, media card that I had would care. I think it, it's like five hours of ProRes on that one card. So you're like, oh man, I could just shoot all day on one card. Yeah, that's all great and dandy. But the problem is that you have to shoot that movie perfectly. So your lighting has to be on point. You cannot mess up. The beautiful thing about shooting raw is that if you do make mistakes on on the set with lighting, not enough lighting, not enough time, which I guarantee on a low budget movie, you will make mistakes. It happens. I made mistakes. But because of the raw file, the raw file allows you to fix those mistakes. If you would have shot ProRes, 
If I would have shot ProRes on this movie, there's a lot of shots that I probably wouldn't have been able to work with. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Purely because of time, light, not having a full grip truck, and many other things that I had did not have on this shoot. But shooting raw saved me. So I would definitely suggest shooting raw. And that is one of the big um, big selling points of the Black Magic cameras is you can shoot raw. Even the pocket camera, which I'll talk to you about in another episode, which I don't own, but I've heard, uh, is great. And you're able to shoot raw. And anytime you can shoot raw, that is what you want to deal with. And then I'll talk about the workflow. I, honestly, I'm going to do an entire podcast about the post workflow, how I worked in DaVinci, how I've colored this in DaVinci, how I edited the entire movie in DaVinci. I'm going to do an entire workflow, uh, you know, talk, talk, uh, podcast about how I did that. But this one's about building this camera rig. So, first things first, obviously, you want to get a Black Magic uh, cinema camera, 2.5. Uh, you can get a four, and it's no problem, but understand that there are just going to be those little workflows. Like on the next movie I do, I'll probably go four. Purely because I, I I now have infrastructure, I've purchased the hard drives that I need, things like that that I can handle a bigger workflow. Uh, since I was doing this all from the beginning, I I just had to kind of play it safe and didn't want to get caught up, even myself in post. Even though I own a post situation, uh, I didn't want to get myself caught up and wanted to make things as simple and easy as I could by while still maintaining the best image quality possible. So uh, get yourself a Black Magic. Again, links for all of these things are on on that uh, on the URL. The media that I used, Kingston Digital. Uh, I got a 480 gig uh, SSD card, and I got a 240 gig. Most of my cards were uh, 240 gigers. I had like four or five of those, and had one 480 gig, uh, which I I used for the big long night. Uh, and they run anywhere from 80 bucks for 81 dollars right now on Amazon for the 240 to 145, and they kind of go on sale every once in a while. But those are those are the prices. I mean, that's really really cheap considering if you try to price out what Red Media costs or what Alexa Media costs, um, it's pretty remarkable. And and also, just so you so you guys know, I had access to full Red Dragons and full Alexas that would have been given to me for free to shoot this movie because I have friends and I have a lot of people that wanted to help me with this movie. But I decided against it. Now, I know everybody listening like, Alex, are you crazy? You could have shot with a red. You could have shot with an Alexa. It would have been so much better. I'm like, yes, the image might have been better. Uh, arguably, it definitely would be better. But for the kind of movie that I was trying to make, which was a low-budget indie dramedy, it was overkill. And I'm going to give you some examples of why I decided to go with a smaller camera that still gave me amazing image quality. One, I can own the camera. I can play with it. I can test it. And I could do all an experiment and do all sorts of different things where if I would have been given this camera, I would have had to have shot. First of all, our schedule was a six-week schedule, meaning that I only shot eight days within those six weeks because we were working around actors' schedules. So because of that, we needed to do uh, many different shooting experiments, things like that. Nobody was going to give me that camera, those cameras for six weeks just sitting around in my house so I can play with. That's not going to happen. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it because I was the DP on this movie and I wanted to kind of play with it, test it, see really what I could do, kind of beat the camera up. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have this camera. Another big point, no production insurance. I didn't need any rental production insurance. So anytime you go to these big houses that are going to give you a $100,000 package, guess what, guys? You need insurance. And I did not have the money, nor did I want to go out and get production insurance. Again, I was trying to make this as simple of a process as possible. And that was a big selling point. Another thing is it's a small footprint. Even that big rig that you guys saw is a smaller footprint that than a red package or an Alexa package on those guerrilla filmmaking moments that you're out on the streets possibly stealing shots possibly going into places that you are not allowed to shoot to get shots having a big rig is going to be a problem that's why the dslrs have been so popular because a lot of people could go out and no one even knows you're shooting a movie so this camera i you know when i had to go into more heavily populated areas where i didn't have particularly uh permission to shoot uh, you having a smaller rig uh, helped dramatically. Could not have done that with an Alexa. Uh, the other big selling point is amazing post-production workflow. 
uh, that I was able to just bring it into DaVinci Resolve, which is owned by Blackmagic. So the workflow is super seamless. Uh, I could edit raw. I can color grade and finish my movie right in there. Uh, and also the affordability of the pimping out of the rig, as I like to say, and customizing it to to fit my shooting needs was so much more affordable. Even if I would have gotten a red camera raw by itself, to try to get a rig, you would have to rent a full-blown rig. But if you were going to try to purchase those kind of uh, ancillary products to kind of help uh, or actually make the damn thing work, you need all these kind of things to make it work. It's super expensive. So shooting with the Black Magic, I was able to create an entire rig, professional, wonderful rig that worked for probably under, I think, I, I, I don't know what the final total was, but it was under 2500 bucks, not including the camera. But just the rig was under twenty five hundred bucks, uh, and probably less than that, uh, with old, probably about two grand. If you include the media and things like that, then it'll probably be around twenty five hundred. But that's ex- insane in the camera world. That's insane, and I'm gonna go over all of those little nifty tricks and uh, vendors that I found that helped me get to this high quality rig at a very low cost. So we've gone over the media. The next thing is the camera cage. The camera cage is something that actually wraps your camera and protects your camera from other th- from you know dings and dumb bang- bangs and stuff. But it also allows it to give it a little bit more weight, and it gives you ability to start building your camera rig. You can start attaching things to the rig itself because it has the the holes that you can kind of screw things in on and kind of build this kind of Frankenstein monster of a camera rig which completely is unique to you. So when camera, when you see camera guys and camera rigs out in the world, those were built by the camera guys themselves. They're very, they're not stock. They're all very specific to the needs of that camera person, that cinematographer, that production, because that's the way it works. So that's what I wanted, that freedom at a, a price, at a definitely a price point. So I use Camtree Hunt Pro Cage, which is for the Blackmagic Cinema Camera. Camtree, by the way, you're going to hear their name a lot. Now, I did not get paid, uh, full disclosure, did not get paid a dime. I've never even been in contact with these people. They've never contacted me. I love Camtree products. They are the most, again, I use this term a lot, best bang for your buck on the market, period. And they have dollies. They have just everything a filmmaker would need at a very affordable price and built pretty solidly. Is it as solid? All right, so let me just, let's just put it this way. This this uh, this rig is uh, $237. A standard camera rig, even on the cheap end, is about eight to $900. And then if you start going into the more professional worlds, the higher end worlds, you're talking three grand, two grand, sometimes up to even five grand for these kind of rigs. This rig was made of metal. It has um, has uh, rods. Uh, you are able to put two uh, two sets of rods in, one at the bottom, one at the top. You've got two wooden handles, a remote switch, which, by the way, saved my ass. I loved having my little remote switch. I basically just grabbed the handle and I would hit the little red button. I didn't have to like fumble to hit the record button on the camera. It actually had a remote cable, which was great. You've got a handle with a top where you could actually mount a mic if you wanted to get like some real you know quick ambient sounds. Uh, and it's just brilliant. And you can just slap it right onto your tripod and you're good to go. It's so amazing. It really, really is. So uh, it works. This this rig works for both the 2.5 uh, cinema camera and the five and the 4K as well. The next is the preview monitor. Now, preview monitors, as you know, are obscenely expensive. And there's ever I mean, you could spend five, seven grand on a preview monitor. I mean, the red preview monitor alone is like three grand, I think, or something along those lines. It's pretty nuts. So I use the Free World FW759 seven inch Ultra HD. Now, again, don't have don't worry about writing all this stuff down, guys. Just go to the URL indiefilmhustle.com forward slash zero ninety eight, and they have I have everything there. So I'm just kind of going over everything. This little monitor is one hundred and forty nine bucks. And it works perfectly. Is it a 1920 by 1080 image? No, it's a 1280 by 800 resolution image. But it's vivid, it's clear, and it's it's nice. It works perfectly fine. I'm not color grading off this monitor. I just needed something else to see. Comes with a hood. This little package comes with uh, an arm. Comes with uh, an HDMI cable. 
comes with a little mount on it, so you can just mount it directly onto your camera. It's really great. Uh, it's awesome. It needs a battery, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, but it was awesome. It's great for steady cams. It's great for low little rigs. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, it works wonderfully. It really, really worked wonderfully for 150 bucks. You can splurge and go to 250. They have different versions, but this is the one that I used. And I was able to mask out my 235 aspect ratio, which is what I shot Megan, which is in a 235 aspect ratio. It's pretty good. You'll see um, you'll see pictures of this rig. Uh, you'll see the pictures of the monitor throughout uh, throughout the post. It's pretty cool. Now, the one big thing you need is though this monitor, and that's this is where the, this is where people get stupid. The the Black Magic camera has a BNC cable out. It does not have an HDMI output. So you need to get an SDI, um, uh, or not BNC, excuse me, an SDI out uh, to an HDMI converter. Now, usually these converters are extremely expensive, especially if you use the Black Magic one specifically, because it's I don't even know how much it is, but it's it's it's, it's pretty expensive. I found one for twenty nine ninety nine. It's wonderful. I attach it to the back of the monitor, ran the cables, and it works perfectly. Works perfectly. Thirty bucks. It's uh the Porta uh, Pet Pesh SDI. Just check the link on the on the post. It's really really great. Wonderful. Uh, the other thing I also needed was obviously a BNC cable. Um, BNC SDI, it's kind of the same thing, but the cable itself, uh, $8.90. Uh, these are all Amazon. Everything I got, I got it on Amazon. Uh, then I got a power uh, power source for the converter. That actually cost 20 bucks, which is one of these <laughs> portable chargers where you can quick charge your iPhone and quick charge uh, like your iPad. I got it for 20 bucks. You slap it on, that thing will last all day. It's wonderful. Uh, and I also use that to run my um, my audio setup, my Tascam, but we'll talk about that another day. Uh, great little trick. It's just, it's just it works. It works great. Uh, the other thing I bought was the portable um, protective travel case for the monitor. This is not a, a luxury, guys. You absolutely need to have this. It's 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks. It protects it. You can put your batteries in there. You can put all your all, everything regarding the monitor. You can put in there. It's great for twenty bucks. Um, the next thing is the batteries. Now you do need batteries, uh, and especially these kind of uh, standard Sony batteries, which are the uh, Li uh, Ion DC batteries. Um, they're like twenty bucks for the small one, twenty one ninety eight for the small ones, and then the bigger ones, which last a little longer, they're a little fatter. Uh, they're forty three bucks, and they come in a package of two. With um with a charger and a car charger as well, if you get caught out there in the world, but uh, it's really great. You slap it on the back, and that I think I changed it with the, once I had the big one on. I think maybe on the longest day we had to swap it out, but it generally, generally lasts all day. It's it was just great. So there you go. Now the next thing I built out was a follow focus. You definitely need a follow focus. Now follow focuses can get stupidly expensive. Uh, and if you know what a follow focus is, guys, follow focus is basically what you attach to these rods that you build in your package. Again, I have pictures and videos of all of this uh, on the post. But you uh, you attach it on, and then you can connect it to the gears of your lenses. And then based on that, you can follow your focus. And I pulled all my own focus on this movie. So I'm actually quite shocked when you guys watch the movie. You'll see certain things that are... Uh, ranking focus and stuff like that. I did that all on the fly. And don't think I'm an expert or anything like that. I just chose the best moments while I was editing. It's also a benefit of being an editor. You can hide all your mistakes. But I I chose the uh, Photaga um, DP503 quick release follow focus, which means that you normally when you put on uh, you know, start building up rigs. If you can do anything that's a quick release, meaning that you can just snap it on and snap it off, as opposed to just running it through the bars and then and then if you like let's say you stack in two or three things which you will on the on the rods then it, let's say you want to pull out the, the quick the, the follow focus because it's not working with your lens set for that, that lens that you have you're like shoot so you have to pull everything out but if you do a quick release all you gotta do is just open it up and it pops right out quick release I, I did a couple quick releases uh in this uh in this package but that was great it's 199 bucks guys it works great is it the best thing in the world no is it there are there better ones out there? Yes. 
Does it do the job? Absolutely. Never, never failed me once on my entire shoot. So that's the thing I'm trying to tell you guys. Don't always look for the shiny, oh, this is the best, this is the best, I need the best. Just find what works. And it might work for one or two projects and then you move on to another piece. But you can't, you know, if, you, if you're going to start building up a rig that's going to last you for the next 10 or 15 years, then you're going to talk about tens of thousands of dollars. But if you buy smart and check your reviews and listen to things like what I'm talking about, someone who's actually shot with everything I'm talking about, it's going to be very helpful to you with any productions or films or anything that you do in, in regards to gear in the future. Now, the next thing is the mat box. The mat box is one of easily one of the most expensive parts of a rig. I've, I, I mean, and I, it took me a while to find this, man. It really did. But to find a solid, there's a lot of cheap, there's a lot of cheap mat boxes out there that are all made of plastic and things like that. Uh, you want to find something that's made of metal that's a little bit sturdy and that can do what you need it to, to get done. And there's so many aftermarket, um, Mat boxes that are built out for DSLRs that could be used for the Black Magic, and um, you just have to find the right one. What I chose was Cam Trees Swing Away Wide Angle Carbon Fiber Mat Box. This was this is a great little a great little mat box that comes in its own little like carrying case, uh, you know, plastic carrying case has all everything you would want. It's a two stage. Matte box. Now, as far as stages are concerned, two stages means that you could put one filter on it or two, and they and actually both rotate, so you can put a polarizing filter in there for uh, for your um your outside shots if you want to use a polarizer. So having a two stage, always get at least two stages, guys. If you get one stage, you know eh, I always gotta get two stages, but it was great. It worked wonderfully, and I loved it. It worked like a it just worked like a charm for me, and it's two hundred and forty five bucks. I mean, seriously, it's 245 bucks. It's remarkable. It really, really worked really well for me, and I loved it. So that's my matte box uh, suggestion. Again, will it last me five or six movies? I don't know. But it lasted me this movie, and it'll probably last me the next movie. And it's and it's pretty robust for what it is. You know, I th- the closest thing I even found to it was like, like $1,500. That was, you know, or $800, $900. That was even remotely close to what this gave me. And for the, again, best bang for your buck. So the cam tree swing away. Oh, and by the way, the swing away aspect of things is really important because if on set you put it all on, the, you, you, you mount it all into the rods and it's all set up. If you got to change a lens, if you don't have a swing away, you got to pull the whole map box off. It slows you down. But with a swing away, you literally just hit a little, little uh, lever and boop, it swings out. Change the lens, pop it right back in, and you're good to go. Well, well worth it. All right, guys? So the Cam Tree Swing Away Carbon Fiber Matte Box. Now, this this is by far the most important piece of equipment I purchased on my camera rig. Uh, I call it the back saver. This is the, camera, the, the Cam Tree Shoulder Rig, and it is... Uh, plus support rod, and this is so important because I was I I was gonna do this entire movie handheld, and uh, you know having this kind of rig on your body, it kills your back. It'll kill your back if I if I you know the few times that I actually shot without the bar, without the support rig, I was dying within five minutes. I was like, oh my god, what this does is it basically gives you a weight belt that you strap onto your to your waist, a a pole like kind of a movable, like a, it's kind of like a little mini tripod that you mount onto the camera rig and you can kind of, if you need to go up high, you can go up high. If you can go down low, you can go low. It's pretty crazy. And the stuff that I was able to get because of it, it was almost like a dolly move sometimes because I was able to just really pivot. It has this really strong um, rubber core that allows you to kind of pivot anywhere you want and it saved i mean I, I literally could sit there all day which i did with the damn thing on and it just did not bother me as much don't get me wrong i was still in you know i was still sore and in pain uh shooting with it but without it i don't think we would have been able to shoot it it just it was so wonderful and the price best uh best 126 bucks i've ever spent <laughs> trust me if you're gonna do any handheld work at all you need to have this uh, and it works with anything. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cam tree rig 
or anything like that. You could use that any place that you have some rods. Uh, it'll plug right in and you can use it. Really, really amazing uh, rig, guys. So definitely use that. Now, I keep talking about camera rods. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Camera rods, are basically these big metal tubes that you can kind of slide into rigs to mount stuff onto. So uh, I use the 18 inch rods because I wanted to have a, a big long handheld rig. And again, you're building this rig for what your production needs. So I knew I was going to shoot a handheld movie. This was never once on sticks in the entire movie. It was never on a pair, on a set of tripod or anything on a dolly. It was always going to be handheld. It was the style that I was going for for this movie. So I had to build a rig that was that was appropriate for what my needs were for the film. So having 18 inch rods, which are huge, by the way, the 24 bucks. Um, I used a small rig black aluminum alloy, and you can get into carbon fiber, you can get into uh, aluminum and all that. You can get into all the details. Dude, guys, this worked fine. You know, you can get the more expensive ones if you want, but these worked perfectly fine. And it allowed me to put on uh, a pad in the back for my shoulder, which I'll get to in a minute, and allowed me to stack on the the mat box, the follow focus, the rig for the for the um, the shoulder rig uh, weight thing, the, the, support, uh, the support rod. Uh, as well as the ri- the arm for the the preview monitor, which I'll show you how I did that in a little bit as well. So it was it's invaluable. You definitely need to have them. But again, you don't need to make it 18 inches. You can use five inch, six inch. I think six six inch, eight inch, twelve inch, twelve, fourteen. I think they have a sixteen and an eighteen. So it just depends. I chose the 18s because it made sense for me and it worked really really great. Um, the next thing I chose uh, that I needed for my rig was camera handles. Now I know you're going to say, well, you already had handles that came, these beautiful wooden handles, um, that came with the, the camera cage, but I decided I wanted to get uh, a little bit, I wanted to get lower so I can go cause up holding it up high, the, the body weight wasn't proper for me. So I wanted to have something a little bit lower base. So it kind of balances everything out a little bit better. So I got the cam tree hunt quick mount 15 millimeter, uh, Rosetta handle set. It's 110 bucks. It's great. And again, you'll see pictures of it in the post. Uh, it's a quick release. Again, so you could just slap it on, poop, 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 slap it off, and, and it was great. And you could adjust it to whatever you want. So I had one a little farther than the other one, and I was able to handle it. So the way I set the rig up is I had one of the wooden handles, the other wooden handle on my on my right. I kept that one because that was the one that had the, the remote button. The other one I took off, never used it, and then I had the two handles at the bottom. So I, I basically held the top wooden handle and then held the bottom left handle. So left handle bottom, right handle wooden top. And I know it's all sounding crazy in a podcast. Just go and look at the video, uh, look at the videos and look at the um the uh, the pictures, and they'll it'll be a lot more clear this way. But anyway, those two things really worked well for me, and I was able to maneuver and move the camera really really well. 110 bucks. It works. It's solid. It worked really, really well. Now, another really expensive part of camera rigs are the batteries to run it. Now, everybody knows that the, at least everyone should know, that the battery that comes internal with the Black Magic isn't that great. It'll last you maybe an hour, hour and a half, maybe, of running time. So it's just kind of sitting there and, and you can't pull it out or exchange it. That's just the way the camera's built. It's one of the things that they decide to do. So they said, look, you're just going to have to get an external battery source. Now, looking into battery sources, you're going to get the V-mount batteries, which are industry standard. Uh, and they, you know, the, the mounts themselves are expensive. You're talking about 300, 400 bucks for the mount. This is just something to plug into the camera. So then you could purchase a battery to, to, bat, to, to mount it up. Now, it is robust. It is great having these V-mounts. Um, they're wonderful, but they're expensive. And if you're doing something on a really low budget, like I was, and again, I wanted to see how low budget I can get and still have it work as an experiment. And I found this amazing little company called Juicebox, Juicebox Batteries. And these guys are amazing for a hundred bucks. By the way, those batteries, those V-mount batteries run two, three hundred dollars, sometimes more uh, per these little juice boxes, because my camera was small and not a Red or an Alexa, it worked beautifully. 
and I'll show you and I'll talk to you about how I was able to mount them. It actually comes with a mount on it. It's like it's a little screw. You can actually screw it into the, the side of the camera rig uh, and you're good to go. And it, and it works perfectly. But I wanted to be a little bit more clever, a little bit more cool. And I wanted to have my own mounting system, like a kind of like a V-mount, but on the cheap. So by the way, these batteries run 109 bucks, And they're built for the Blackmagic uh, pocket cameras as well as the production cameras. They will last my the camera around three to four hours each. So I probably most of the time never I, even on the, the my biggest day I never ran more than two batteries. So they basically just cover you for the most of the day. And then when the, when the camera is not being worked on or we're breaking or something, I turn the camera off. Don't let the camera just keep running and running and running. So it's great. And the wonderful thing about it is it, it actually juices up the battery inside the camera. So when you run out of battery, so when that battery dies the battery inside the camera picks up. So you never get a loss or a drop or like, oh my God, which you would have on a Red or an Alexa because they don't have internal batteries. This has an internal battery. So if, if you're on a run and you stuff like that, you still got, let's say that you, you run out of battery, you still have about an hour, hour and change of the internal battery left to keep shooting. And I pushed it a lot of times so I could just keep shooting. So it's a wonderful system. I really loved it. I got three batteries. Those three batteries lasted me the entire shoot. Because I, I just figured, I'm like, I'm never going to shoot more than 12 hours. Uh, and I'm never going to have the camera running more than 12 hours in a row in one day. And uh, by the way, once you pull one off, you could just start charging. And it takes about a couple, two to three hours to charge it up. Um, so it's fine. Uh, it worked great. I loved it. Juice box, 109 bucks For the price of one battery, you can have three and that that cover you. So basically, for the three hundred bucks, basically, which will cost a normal V mount battery, you can get three of these guys, and they're a little bit lighter, and they just work really, really nicely. Now, what I like to call is the Gorilla Battery Mount. How I was able to mount it to my camera and have kind of like a quick, you know, kind of like a a quick release mount. What I decided to do is I bought a um a quick release clamp adapter for it's basically like a camera plate, uh, a tripod plate. But it was really small, and you can screw it right into the back of. I screwed it right into the back of my shoulder pad, which I want to talk about in a second. And I, I then I screwed the other end into the back of the 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 juice box, which by the way comes with screw holes built into the battery. They know what they're doing, so you can just you can just attach it to anything, and then you just easily just go pop 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 in pop out, and you, it was great. It was just wonderful. I have a video showing the entire process. In the in the uh, in the post, and again, guys, I keep referring back to the post. This is one of those podcasts that is basically helping or um, giving you a little bit deeper dive into the post because you need to visually see a lot of this stuff uh, to be able to understand it. So this is just kind of like an ancillary piece to kind of help support piece for the post. But I want, and I'm going into a lot more detail in the podcast than I did in the post purely because I'm talking as opposed to writing. So, the uh, that, and that by the way, that cost uh, $7.40. <laughs> so I bought five of them. Uh, I had a couple extra just in case anything went down, and you were good to go. The next thing I bought was the shoulder rig. Uh, it's a Camtree Hunt flexible shoulder rig mount, which I originally was going to use as a shoulder mount, but like a full-blown shoulder mount before I found the the shoulder rig with the support rod. So what I did is you could just un- I just unscrewed the, the the actual shoulder pad, which was great. By the way, the price is 125 bucks. The you could pull out the pad, which was great. It has all sort of mounting capability on it, and that's where I mounted the battery. And then the arm aspect of it, I used to mount my monitor. It was great. So I just I just put it into the rods, and then it was a very flexible arm, so I could kind of move it wherever I wanted. And it just I just screwed it in, and we're out the door. It was great. Uh, the Camtree flexible shoulder mount. 125 bucks. Can't go wrong. So guys, that's basically it. Now, you'll see an extra uh, handle that I had. I had an extra old um wooden uh, wooden camera handle. It was like 125 bucks. That's rubber and stuff. I had it when I owned my red camera, and I just had it lying around so I used it and it was really nice having two handles to kind of jump the ca- you know, pull the camera on and off, but it's not needed. Uh but other than that, everything that's on that rig, I've just talked to you about. And that's the breakdown of how I was able to build a pimped out camera rig. And the final price for this entire rig, I'm going to tell you is 2,150 bucks approximately for everything I told you in here, including the batteries. 
So that's including all the batteries and including all the media. So you can drop the media depending on what your needs are. But that alone right there was like three, four hundred extra bucks. So for say twenty one hundred and fifty dollars, I pimped out an entire black magic rig. And then the black magic itself is retails for about two thousand bucks. But this is what I did when I bought it originally. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I bought the I bought it with um, by the way it comes with a, a, a an official copy of DaVinci Resolve. So that DaVinci Resolve uh retails for about like 700 bucks, 800 bucks or I think it retails for like 1000 bucks for the for the retail version. So it has the dongle. So what I decided to do was I took uh cuz I already own DaVinci, but you if you already have you can get a free version of DaVinci and it will handle pretty much almost everything that you would need it done. Uh, so you really don't need it unless you absolutely want it, but what I did was I took that DaVinci that da Vinci, um, copy and I sold it on Amazon because that's the way I hustle. Uh, I sold it for, I think it was 650 bucks. So for that 650 bucks, dropped the price down of that camera to uh, 1350 bucks as opposed to 2000 So there you go. It just saved you 650 bucks by doing that. And there's not a lot of competition for that, by the way, on Amazon. So, or you can sell it on eBay as well. Um, but you'll get at least five or 600 bucks for that DaVinci dongle. And there you go. And if you don't need it, unless you absolutely and do the research of what your needs are for DaVinci, if you're going to use DaVinci as a finishing or editing program, uh, then do it. But there you go. So honestly, all in for under thirty five hundred bucks, for under thirty five hundred bucks, if you use my DaVinci technique to sell, you've got an entire camera rig package. No lenses yet. Lenses are another story. But entire camera package you've got for under thirty five hundred dollars. That's going to shoot you. Cinema quality images that, and you're shooting raw. It's pretty remarkable, guys. I mean, the world that we live in is pretty amazing. So, I again, I went out to make This Is Meg, not only to prove that I can make a good movie that I enjoyed enjoy watching, but that I can do it on the cheap and do it myself. That's one of the reasons why. I mean, I have a ton of cinematographer friends who wanted to DP this for me for free. And I said, no, I'm going to do it. Because I want to prove that it can be done. It was an experiment. And that's what Meg is. A lot of Meg was an experiment to see what we can get done on the lowest budget that we could get everything done on. And we did. And I can't wait for you guys to see the quality of the images, the quality of the story, uh, which I really love, and and the performances of the actors and Jill and everybody. Um, But on a technical standpoint, I wanted to see what could be done. I wanted to do something that really is not done as much anymore or at all. You know, how many movies have you heard that's been shot on the Da Vinci, the, the Black Magic Da Vinci 2.5, edited on a Da Vinci and colored in a Da Vinci and finished in a Da Vinci? Um, it's, it's not something you see every day. So I wanted to prove that it could be done with tools that you guys all have access to. So that is, that was my, one of my goals in making This Is Meg. I wanted to prove to you guys that it can be done. And hopefully I've shined a little bit of light, a little beacon that says, holy crap, if Alex can go do this, I can go do this too. I can re- I can scrounge up two, three grand and get myself this camera package. And by the way, you can also probably get the 4K version. You know, there's a lot of used versions and you know, used things out there on eBay and on Amazon and things like that uh, that you can buy a, a little bit cheaper. Now, everything I bought, by the way, all this rig stuff was all brand new. So you could try to buy it used if you want to go even cheaper. But I wanted stuff new, at least you know, because it was so cheap anyway. I was like, screw it. Let me just get the new stuff. But I hope this inspires you guys to say, shoot, man, I can go shoot this. I can go make a movie. And that's what I really hope This Is Meg does for all of you guys, for the tribe and for anyone who hears this story, that it can be done, that we can go do it. And there's no excuses anymore. Because I know a lot of you guys out there, I'm like, oh, I don't have the money to go rent a red, or I don't know what I'm doing, and I need to hire a DP, and I need to do all this and all that. Well, you know what? You do, and that's fine if you want to, or you can go my route and educate yourself enough. You know, Because if you buy this camera, take six months and go shoot a bunch of shorts. Take six months and just start playing if, you, if you're starting from scratch. And start playing and seeing what you can do with the camera. Push the camera. Push yourself. You know, Shoot tests. Come back. That is the wonderful thing about owning your own rig where you can go off and play and do experiments 
and see what works and what doesn't work. So when you go into battle, when you go onto a feature film, you're ready to go. You're ready to rock and roll. You know, and I did a lot of testing before, but I learned a lot. Every day I shot on Meg, I learned something new about the lighting, about the camera, about the lenses, about what I can do. And not to even mention, let's talk about the story and, and working with the actors and things like that. You always learn every time you shoot. But on a technical standpoint, since I was holding so many hats or wearing so many hats on this project, I learned so, so much from doing it. So guys, there's no freaking excuse, man. There's just no excuse. All right? I don't want to hear anybody. I just I just talked to a guy who made a movie with the Black Magic pocket camera. The pocket camera, for God's sakes. Not even the cinema camera, the pocket camera, which brand new is a thousand bucks. Used, you could probably get it for five or six hundred. And there's rigs for all of that too that Cam Tree makes as well. That you can go shoot an entire movie with the, the pocket camera. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, I'm like, shoot, man, that's even nuttier. But you know what? He got a movie made and, he's, and he's, he rocked the, he rock and rolled with it. And it's, it's off and it looks great. It looks great because even with the pocket camera, you can shoot raw. And that's the key, guys. Shoot raw, shoot raw, shoot raw. But. I hope, again, I hope this inspires you to not sit on your ass and you can go out and make something and don't wait for like the best and the brightest and I need this or I need that. And one other thing, guys, a lot of people that don't want you to succeed or are jealous or are just little trolls, let's call them, that don't want you to succeed or are jealous or any of this stuff are going to tell you, oh, God, you're shooting with the black magic. What a piece of crap camera that is. I actually had someone say that to me on this project, and, and I heard it from a second source, and I said to myself, you know what, man? You can keep talking all your crap, but you know what? I've got a movie made. What have you done? Huh? There you go. That's the best kind of revenge. Just go, you know what? It's fine. You can say whatever you want, but I've got a feature made, and I'm going to have two more next year, and I'm going to just keep going. I'm not going to let anybody tell me, oh, it's not the best or what a crap camera or it doesn't have this or there's a crop ratio with your lenses and all this stuff. Look, guys, it is what it is. And you do what you can. Now, one big, huge tip, guys. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a little tangent here. One huge, 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 huge tip. And I'm going to put this on the uh, on the post is if I was going to buy a brand new camera today, this is what I would do. Because I bought a camera that had an EF mount. An EF mount is basically a Canon lens mount. So you can only use Canon lenses on it. So what I would do is I would buy a micro four thirds mount. And you're going, Alex, but I I don't want to use micro four thirds lenses. I'm not suggesting you do. But what you do do is you buy something called the Metabones adapter. The Metabones adapter, this is this magical piece of gear. It's about six, seven hundred bucks. It is quite pricey in our world. But for what it does, it is amazing. And I would have bought it if I could have done it, but they don't have a Canon to Canon mount. So when I buy my next Black Magic, I'll buy a Micro Four Thirds and then just have this adapter live on it. What this adapter does, it gives you another stop of light. So if you have a 1.8 lens, you end up shooting at a 0.8. This is like Stanley Kubrick style lenses, uh, lens uh, like uh, uh, light uh, sensitivity, like what he shot with Barry Lyndon. I think Barry Lyndon was at a 0.8 or a 0.7 to shoot that sensitivity. That's what it does. It allow, It basically takes all of the light available coming into the lens and just focuses it all. Also, there's this little thing called a crop factor because we are shooting with the Black Magic Cinema. It's not a full uh, full sensor a super 35 millimeter full sensor size. So in other words, when you put an 18 millimeter on the lens, you're not getting really an 18, you're getting more like a 24 uh, millimeter. So you get a crop factor. So you're not getting everything that the, the lens can give you. This Metabones helps with that. It helps eliminate much of the crop factors. You get bigger images. You get more of what the lens has to offer. It is magical, man. I can't wait to start using it. I saw testing with it. It's great. The Metabones adapter. I'm going to put it at the very end as a bonus on the um, on the post. And if I haven't said it enough, the post for this, uh, the show notes for this is IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 098. So guys, I hope this uh, shines light on my camera rig. I hope you get some inspiration out of it that you guys can go out and do this yourself. I mean, seriously, go out and do this yourself. Don't let anything stop you guys. There's no excuses. It's not 1997 anymore. It doesn't cost millions of dollars to go make a movie. 
You can go make your movie. Tell your story. And as I always say, you have a responsibility to get your art out into the world because you have no idea how your art will affect another human being. So now we're done with the inspirational talk. I'm off my soapbox now. Uh, episode 100 is coming up, guys, and I have I have some things cooking. I think you guys are going to be really excited to hear what is going to be on that episode. I have I think I have a little surprise for you. I'm not sure yet, but it's episode 100. It's a monumental episode for me because I can't believe that I've done 100 episodes in a little bit over a year because I'm crazy uh, and I have. I have a life, but I don't know how I, I'm able to do everything I do, but I do it. Anyway, so uh, keep an eye out in the next uh, next week. It'll come out. So keep an eye out and definitely listen to that episode. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. So guys, as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 